Welcome to another session of Bard Talk, the program that asks all the questions that Duncan Garner and Mike Hosking seem so desperate to avoid. Tonight I'm really pleased to have as my guest my old nemesis, Dr. Nick Smith. Please welcome him to the <laughs> Oh, Nick, it's so good to see you again. Um, you've slipped a long way down the National Party rankings since we first met. In fact, you're almost on a, on a par with Peter Dunn, a kind of blown rose commentator on politics of the moment. Um, still, good of you to be here and brave of you. Are you feeling at all nervous? Uh, I confess to being a little bit perky this evening. <laughs> I'm pleased to hear it now. But at number 18, the only way you seem to be able to get noticed these days is by being marched out of Parliament by the Sergeant of Arms with that throwaway comment of yours, what sort of a Nazi establishment is running this place? Ooh. What's going on there? Uh, I've been around in Parliament debating a number of legitimate questions. That's my job. Yeah, but the, the rights or wrongs have been thrown out aside. It's a Nazi comment that caught my attention, and most people's. Now see, when you sacked ECAN in 2010, what you did in effect, and this is according to the New Zealand Law Society Rule of Law Committee, is you suspended the rule of law. Now wasn't that exactly the agenda of the German Chancellor in 1938? And I remind people, I'm an engineer, not an historian. <laughs> Here's the thing. My father and his companions went to Europe in 1940 to shoot people. We wanted to unravel natural justice, the Bill of Rights, the Magna Carta, democracy. The people my father were fighting were called Nazis. Most people from your side of the house are quite pleased to call the present red, grey and green coalition socialists. <laughs> so what is Jacinda exactly? A person who evinces social responsibility or a raving fascist? <laughs> Would you want me to wait till I'm absolutely 100% sure? <laughs> Here, let me help you. Take a look at the monitor. Here's the social democrat who's leading our country at the moment, and a bunch of other social democrats. And here's the neoliberal who wants to lead our country, and a bunch of other neoliberals. <laughs> Now last week's high-profile conniption wasn't the first time you've been the focus of controversy. In 2007, you were fired from Cabinet for abuse of office. I'm referring to the Bromwin Puller affair. Yeah. Ms. Puller uh, is a delicate flower that we must be continuously out to protect and safeguard. So it was not an affair, she's just your... My friend and colleague. In other words, you're just friends. Uh, that's correct. <laughs> okay, just good friends. But a friend with benefits, apparently. Because when she was denied ACC compensation, she felt able to ask you, the Minister of ACC, to put pressure on the office to look at her case with more favour than they were inclined to. Ooh. How many times I'm just simply saying that we got a bum deal. You were fired from camera, forced to make an apology on camera, tears everywhere, highly embarrassing, something you think the public would never forget. But luckily for you, as for all politicians, the public has a memory equivalent to that of a goldfish with Alzheimer's. <laughs> what I found most interesting about the saga were the connections. Bronwyn Puller is a friend of right-wing blogger Kate Hodges who leaked Nikki Hager's address details to Cameron Slater with the suggestion that if the tax haven seeking Chinese found out that Hager was outing them, they might be inclined to do him an injury. Cameron was also being fed ammunition out of Cabinet by Judith Collins, who in turn was being supported by party president Michelle Bogue, whose publicity manager happened to be your just good friend, Bronwyn Puller. Which reminds me, you remember Michelle Bogue saying that COVID-19 can't be all that dangerous given there have been 18 other COVIDs? <laughs> well, that's not correct. Well, of course it's not correct, and now we have her leaking confidential patient information, which is also not correct. Her excuse is, in her words, that she developed an unhealthy relationship with politics which had put her on a self-destructive path. Note, it was politics' fault, not hers, never hers. So all these just friends of yours, Nick, do you think politics has been an unhealthy occupation for you too? Are you ready to retire? No, I'm almost embarrassed 
that I get thousands of emails from people that saying you just can't do it. Well, I would have thought continually playing the political hard man must be exhausting. It's far easier in politics to give out goodies than it is to make people to pay for things. We're going to be discussing Shane Jones later in the program, but back to Ian. <laughs> the term you persistently used to discredit them was dysfunctional. It must be particularly embarrassing for you to find that one of those councillors you sacked is now Minister for Conservation. <laughs> Do you think there's a case here for an apology? And my answer is yes, there is. Dysfunction, Nazis, these are words designed to attract attention. Rather than listen to carefully crafted policies, the public want to be entertained, is that right? That's not correct. But policy is boring now. Conflict, on the other hand, captures the imagination. Everybody likes to fight. The trick is to win, and often, winning is simply being the last man standing. Now, you may be 18th on the list, but you're still here. You're a survivor. <laughs> uh, I'm actually quite proud. You will have to get Nicola Toki to put you on the endangered species list. As long as she hasn't sold her soul back to Fontero or Maggie Barry. Speaking of prima donnas, though, I was surprised, as you must have been, by the choice of Brownlee for Judith's sidekick. What was your first reaction? What the hell? You're not alone. Everybody in Christchurch outside Ireland and Fennelton despises the man for his inept handling of the rebuild. How would you describe him? It's a ball of about 5.5 square metres. A massive, great gas-generating station. It's just blowing the hot air around and around and around Parliament. I wish him well. Uh, a number of questions here from viewers. Edward asks, was the ECAN Act and the Central Plains Irrigation Scheme pushed through by National because Amy Adams and the Carter family owned various properties in the Central Plains? Well, that's not correct either. You're an engineer, Nick. What is it about water and farming with you? My granddad was a dairy farmer uh, in the beginning part of the last century for 50 years. Yeah, and I'll bet he made a perfectly good living from a handful of cows without ravaging the commons in the process. Which brings me to the next question from a viewer who's lived 20 years in the Ashburton region. The last 10 years, his family have suffered from explosive diarrhea syndrome. Frank's question is... Yeah, yeah, it's really funny if you haven't had it. Frank's question is, how much cow shit is presently running down at Canterbury Rivers? It are about half a ton per person. Well, so in other words, David Parker's water reforms are practically the status quo. What would your granddaddy think? What would our trading partners think? So I'm not naive. You cannot promote yourself as 100% pure. It's just not realistic. Oh. Um, Julian asks, is it true that when you went swimming in the Manawatu River to prove the water was clean, you had to be rescued two minutes later by a dock ranger and put in a goldfish bowl filled with bottled water from China? That's not true. <laughs> then Nick, how can you explain these pictures? <laughs> is really hard and technical. I still do not understand all the ins and outs. Uh, Alison asks, when it comes to the big ideas like turning Canterbury into one giant dairy farm, your major obstacle has always been democracy. Do you think for us to move forward now as a country, we need to get rid of these old egalitarian ideals and set up governance by the business round table with Margaret Baisley as a kind of benign regent? That's a long question, but what do you think? And that is what I sort of describe as the global conundrum. You mean if you had your way, we'd be disestablishing Parliament right now? Uh, my view is, the sooner we start, wow. the easier the transition is going to be for New Zealanders. <laughs> Thank you, Nick, for some unusually honest answers. And I'm going to say goodnight. But look, before we wrap up, um, I, just, I just need to ask this. Throughout this interview, I noticed your eyebrows didn't move once. But as every actor knows, all emotion is held in the brow. So, do you think your lack of expression betrays a tendency to sociopathology? Ooh. I'm not a sociopath. Uh, I'm actually a very cheap puppet. <laughs> yes, Minister. I hope you can join us again, maybe shortly before the election, to have another session on Bard Talk. Uh, meantime, Next week we're hoping to interview Shane Jones, the man who famously treated himself to unlimited pornography at the taxpayer's expense, but more importantly, took up a National Party shut-up gift of roving Pacific ambassador while serving in the Labour opposition. 
Again, a self-serving act, a sinecure that cost the taxpayer $1 million. We were having difficulty contacting Shane until a few days ago, when Murray McCulley's proctologist discovered where he was holed up. Until we get Shane into the studio, and as a self-described professional politician, it's only a matter of dollars, then it's good night from everybody here at Bar Talk, and thank you so much for choosing us over Netflix. Good night. Thank <laughs> you.